Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for an important matrix presentation of research and a panel discussion on Latino women's representation in media and beyond. I'm Dr. Malik Moazam Dolat, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Caroline Heldman and Professor Claire Crawford from the Critical Theory and Social Justice Department. This event is co-hosted by the Departments of Critical Theory and Social Justice, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, as well as Media, Arts, and Culture here at Occidental College. So this event is also sponsored by the Representation Project, which is an intersectional gender justice organization. The Rep Project is releasing its Latino Women in Media fact sheet today in conjunction with this event. And we're sharing a link to this research in the chat, so look for that. Please share it widely with your networks. So one quick housekeeping point before I turn it over, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, but at any time you can enter your questions uh, using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so, and now I'll turn this over to my colleague, Professor Heldman. Thank you, Professor Mazam Dolat, and it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Rebecca Cooper, who is the Research Director at the Representation Project. She's going to present some original new data uh, on Latin women's representation. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of her life. Uh, Rebecca Cooper is an Oxy graduate and, as I mentioned, the Director of Research at the Rep Project. She previously worked as the Senior Project Manager for the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media and was a research lead for Agenda for Children in New Orleans. Rebecca is also a celebrated slam poet who runs half marathons and lives in New Orleans with her dog, Olive, her cat, Pizza, and her partner, Gina. Becca, we're excited to see what new research you have for us. Thank you so much. All right, so let me share this with you. So um, today I'm just gonna take you through some previous research on Latin women in media um, and also some new stuff that we have too. Um, but what you'll notice is that the story is pretty much staying the same. Um, so first off, let's look at the, uh, the presence of Latin women in film. So the 8.2% of the population um, is Latin women, but only sadly 1.9% of leads um, in film. So this is US film, the most popular from the last decade. Um, and this comes from the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, which um, is an awesome org doing a lot of this research. And, and you'll no notice a lot of this research is gonna be um, from their reports. So yeah, 1.9% of, of film leads were Latin women. Um, okay, and let's go to this next slide. There we go. Um, so just to get a, a sense of the last decade. So this is actually the last 11 years from 2011 to 2021. Um, and we just put together the Latin lead. So this is men and women from the last decade. Um, and you can see that there's definitely a trend upward, right? We're definitely seeing some progress. But as you remember from the last slide, still, you know, this is in, 20, in 2021, that's nine um, Latinx leads, right? So it's still, still far underrepresented. Um, but you can also see that Lat Latin women are outnumbered almost two to one um, when it comes to, and that's outnumbered by men leads. Um, and this is again in the top 100 films from the last um, 10 years. So you can see there's definitely progress in terms of Latinx leads overall. And there's also progress for Latinx women. And in 2021, 20, um, there was about half of the Latinx leads were women. Um, and you can see in 2019, Latin women had a great um, year with uh, four out of five of the Latinx leads being women. Um, oh, one other finding I wanted to point out here too, it's kind of hard to see all of the characters because um, the pictures are small, but another trend we notice is the definite um, presence of colorism in um, Latinx um, representation that you, uh, vast majority of the characters and leads um, in film um, are have light skin, skin tones and uh, the presence of Afro Latinx characters and especially leads are almost non-existent. So that's another thing I wanted to point out too. Um, this is a stat again from the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative. So 59% of the top grossing films from 2019 had no Lat Latin women characters at all. And again, I want to just point out that this is, the denominator here is films, right? So the, it's a low bar. The film had to have one Latin woman character in order to pass this. So 59% of the top films um, had no Latin women characters at all, which is pretty stark. And then let's take a look at TV. So this stat comes from Nielsen um, from a 2020 report that shows um, only 2.5% of TV characters Latin women. So again, vast underrepresentation when it comes to Latin women in, in TV, um, same as film. 
when we look behind the scenes, the story unfortunately doesn't get better. Um, so in the past decade, fewer than 1% of the top films were uh, directed by Latinx women. Um, and you can see there were 35 um, individual Latinx directors from 2007 to 2019, and only three of those were Latinx women. So um, there's an absolute need for more uh, Latinx women, both on the screen and behind the scenes. Um, just taking a look real quick at the award show. So first, the Oscars. Um, the Oscars, we, we've had 93 years of the Oscars. We looked at the category for best picture, which is the final award given um, in the Oscars and the most prestigious, which gives us a really good look at, you know, what, what stories are being elevated, which are being erased, and who's, which stories are being uh, rewarded. So the only best picture winner in 93 years to center a Latin woman was West Side Story in 1961. Um, and it is important to note that the character playing Maria was Natalie Wood, who was a white woman. So we actually have never had a, a best picture um, Oscar winner um, featuring a Latin woman played by a Latin actor. Um, and the story is similar when we look at the Emmys. As soon as this slide loads, let's see, there we go. Um, so we look at the best comedy series winner and the best drama series winner for the for the Emmys, excuse me. Um, there's only been one outstanding series to win in either of those categories. And this was the Rockford Files in 1978 featuring Rita Moreno. Um, and again, um, this so this was a winner for the, the outstanding drama series category. Um, and we included this because Rita Moreno won for a leading actress, but even this show um, mainly focused on the man in the show, right? So even, even within this winner, it's still hard to make a case for that show centering the life of a Latin woman. Um, and we still have never seen a comedy series uh, winner in the Emmys featuring a Latin woman lead. All right. So not only is it important to see Latinx representation and, and more Latinx characters, we definitely, there's a need for that, um, but it's also important to have quality representation for Latin women too. So one way that we measure that is by um, the harmful tropes and stereotypes that pop up when we um, do see Latinx characters on the screen. So here are a list, I won't read all of them, but a list of some of the stereotypes we, we look for that are the most prominent when um, Latinx women are um, being represented in film and TV. Some of the more common ones will, are that they can't control their temper, um, hyper-sexualized, um, hyper-religious, and oftentimes shown as poor and coming from poverty. So just real quick, I want to go over three of the tropes, the most common tropes for Latin women that we see. The first is the maid trope, um, and this has, we've seen this forever in the history of media. Um, two examples of, this is, so this is a, a Latinx woman who works as a maid, oftentimes in a private house, hotel, oftentimes working for white people. Um, and two examples of this are Family Guy, Consuela's character in Family Guy, um, which is a horrific um, depiction of a Latinx woman. Every stereotype and trope in the book is in that portrayal. Um, and then also in um, Made in Manhattan, a movie from 2002. Another common trope we see is the non-English speaker. So this is a Latinx woman character who's shown um, as either only being able to speak Spanish or not speaking English or speaking with broken English. And oftentimes this is a plot, a plot device um, used to evoke laughter. This is um, making Latinx women's um, language the butt of the joke and no better example than um, Gloria's character from Modern Family. And you can see this um, caption here, um, just an example of one of many scenes where um, her, her ability to con to communicate with her husband or inability to communicate with her husband is the center of the joke. And the third trope to look at um, is the spicy sex pot. And this is again, um, a trope that we've seen show up throughout the history of cinema. Um, so this is a Latinx character, a woman who is highly sexual, usually wearing very revealing clothing and very flirty and promiscuous in nature. And two um, kind of classic examples of this trope are um, Selma Hayek's character from Dust Till Dawn in the 1996 film, I think, by Quentin Tar Tarantino, um, just kind of epitomizes that trope. Um, and also the character from Desperate Housewives, Gabby, played by Eva Longoria, who is shown as hypersexualized, flirty, um, kind of sexually insatiable. Um, and that is sort of what her character is boiled down to. Um, so yeah, that is all I've got. Uh, just to summarize it, we need more Latinx women in media. We need more Latinx women leading um, TV shows and films. And when they show up, we need to do a better job of representing Latinx women in ways that aren't damaging and harmful. All right, back, I will pass it on to you now to hear from our 
incredible panelists. All right, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. So first we have with us Pamela Campos. Pamela Campos is a researcher who has worked for the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media and the Representation Project. She earned a BA in sociology with an emphasis on diversity and inequalities from Cal State University, Los Angeles. She is currently studying applied cognitive psychology, user experience at Claremont Graduate University. In addition to her passion for bringing data-driven change to the big screen, she is interested in developing accessible technology and creating inclusive spaces with the tech industry. Thank you, Pamela, for being with us here being here with us today. Uh, Soraya Jakarti. Soraya Jakarti is a researcher, educator, consultant, speaker, working in both the media and entertainment and nonprofit circuits. She is a senior researcher at the Norman Lear Center at USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. Here, she is part of the Media Impact Project team. Previously, she has served as Associate Director of Research at the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media and has worked with content creators, ad agencies and nonprofits like the Representation Project, Promundo, and Plan International. Thank you, Soraya, for being here with us today. And last, with us, we have Veronica Hernandez. Veronica Hernandez is a product manager at Nielsen, managing Grace Note Inclusion Analytics, a data product that measures on-screen representation to shed light on what the media industry can do to increase representation of historically underrepresented groups. Veronica previously worked as a researcher at the Gina Davis Institute for Gender and Media and a computer science instructor at the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. She is a graduate of Occidental College. Thank you, Veronica, for being here with us. Yay, thank you all. What a great panel. Um, so let's get started. Qu a question for Soraya. You are living and breathing this data, right? You're looking at this data. Um, and have been for years. Let's get a really good handle on the problem of Latin women's representation in media. Um, how are Latin women typically represented um, beyond maybe some of the basics that Rebecca provided um, in entertainment media and news media? What are some of the more egregious ways in which they are stereotyped and misrepresented? Yeah, so excellent question. Um, so, you know, Latin folks account for about one in five Americans. It's a big population. Um, and according to the Motion Picture Association, um, Latin folks actually go to the movies more often than any other group. However, as Becca alluded to earlier, they're incredibly underrepresented in, in film. So Latin women make up only 6.5% of all female protagonists and 1.9% of leads, again, as Becca showed earlier. Um, but also a range of academic studies have found that Latin characters are more likely than characters of other ethnic groups to be in lower status occupations, involved or affiliated with criminal activity, um, as being less articulate. Um, and here, with when it comes to ar ar being articulate, I think that there's a bit of a weaponization of accents. And I actually think it's great that you had the modern family example, Becca, because it's um, an example that I was thinking of. A lot of times accents is, are used not just to mock, but to kind of depict a character as being unintelligent. I think of a particular episode in Modern Family where Gloria says, do you even know how smart I am in Spanish, right? So the accent is a way in which we show um, that she's not intelligent, right? That she's ditzy. Um, similarly, academic research has found that Latin women are often shown as lazier, as verbally aggressive, AKA the fiery hot-tempered Latina um, and is having a low work ethic. Um, and so, you know, other research also from the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative has found that um, in some instances, Latin women are more likely than women of other ethnic ethnicities to be shown in various states of undress or nudity on screen. Um, so in general, you know, kind of the big picture that I think about is Latin women are already so underrepresented that it's nearly impossible to showcase the diversity within, the diversity and the complexity within Latin women. Latin women who are LGBTQ, who are are disabled, who are over 40, you know, what chance do these women have of proper representation if Latin women are already so few and far between? So obviously there's, you know, there's a wide range of issues with regards to representation of Latin women. And I would love to see even more research um, tackling that particular topic. Thank you, Soraya. Brilliant answer. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. After all these years, still missed the mute button. Um, so this question is for Veronica. And Veronica, can you what can you tell us about what's happening with Latinas in the U.S. versus what we see in the media? 
Yeah, I mean, I think Rebecca and Soraya have laid it out perfectly. There are very harmful tropes that are out there. And the problem isn't that we have uh, Latinas represented as uh, lower wage workers or um, like having a sex life. The problem is that this is all we're seeing and we're seeing them in like an undignified way in a very um, one dimensional way. The US Latin experience is really hard to define. Um, and we know that it's often perceived as synonymous with the immigrant experience. And that is a very large part of the fabric of our community. A lot of us are immigrants or we have family members that are immigrants or um, friends that are have um, an immigrant experience. But the truth is that most Latino youths are not immigrants. In fact, two thirds were born here in the US and this young super group is optimistic about their futures. We're bilingual, we're bicultural and we have a really high value on both educational attainment and career success. Um, in relation to media, our community also consumes media differently. And when it comes to inclusion and representation, our expectations are becoming firmer and firmer of content creators, media platforms, and brands to accurately represent us. And I think that this um, is plays hand in hand with like the fact that a lot of us are now US born and, and we're kind of like demanding that we're represented in spaces that before we um, weren't demanding that representation in the same way. Um, Latinas specifically are breaking the glass ceiling by continuing to push forward, becoming breadwinners and the primary decision makers in their household. We're seeing that um, reflected in our data. Latin entrepreneurs make up one of the fastest growing entrepreneurial segments in the US, outpacing the total US population for new business creation. This is according to the US census. And like Becca mentioned earlier, Latinas are 8% of the US population and with just less than 3% of representation across TV, TV, this just like there's no way that we can accurately represent the large diversity that exists within our community and we need to see more. There's just, we need more. Thank you uh, for that great answer. So I guess to build off of that, when we're considering what more it looks like. Pamela, you work as a researcher for various media research organizations. What are the most compelling findings from research that you wish everyone knew? So I wish that everyone knew about the serious disparities in representation for Latin people relative to the population. For example, in the most watched ads on YouTube in the US in 2021, only 6% of characters were Latina. When we make up over uh, 18% of the U.S. population and hold a significant amount of consumer power in this country. Another important thing to be aware of, as Soraya, Becca, Veronica mentioned already, um, is that when we are represented, we're often reduced to tropes and stereotypes. The hypersexualization of Latina characters, especially Latin women, is a finding that comes up over and over again, and that can be operationalized as excessive nudity and overt flirtatiousness. Uh, it's we're also frequently cast into roles where we're serving white people and seeing these things come up over and over and over again is really exhausting. Ultimately, I do hope that this data will be used in writing rooms to inform how Latin characters are depicted. And on the bright side, it does seem that we're slowly but surely seeing a rise in stories told by Brown creatives. And I really look forward to seeing Latin characters getting more complex and well-developed storylines. Thank you, Pamela. Okay, so we have identified the problem, I think, or the contours of the problem. We could spend hours on this and you could read lots of books and get a better handle, but I think we have a really good sense of the issues with underrepresentation and then misrepresentation. So let's pivot, let's, let's shift gears here to talk about um, what y'all are doing to fix it, because this panel is a panel of experts. Everyone on this panel is uh, working in various ways to fix this problem, but y'all are using data, which is a really great kind of through line here. Veronica, I want to ask you, you're working for Nielsen. Um, how do you use data for good, and what can you tell us day to day about uh, your data science and advocacy work life? Yeah, I am really proud of the work that we do at Nielsen. Because I think thanks to the tremendous work that are, or, or the organizations represented on this panel, um, we have known for a really long time that there are significant gaps in both the quality and the quantity of representation. 
We think that by bringing a product like inclusion analytics to market, we're able to complement that work by delivering data directly to our clients in a regular and in a granular way and tie this data to outcomes like audience metrics or brand resonance so that they can make informed decisions about their investments in inclusive content. Our can you tell us anything more about not specifically who your clients are, but you have this treasure trove of data uh, and sorry to interrupt. I'm just, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how it works. Like what sort of data are you giving them that they can then use for decision-making? Yeah, definitely. So our clients at Nielsen use our data in a variety of ways across the entire media ecosystem from finding talent to creating user experiences when you're looking for content in a, in a UI um, or understanding the success of that content through audience metrics. So we take like the discovery use case and the out, we hear like algorithms thrown out all the time. There is an algorithm that is represent, that is recommending content to you by making diversity a part of that algorithm and weighting that in a way that makes it easier to identify diverse content, expose diverse content, reach new audiences and retain subscribers that are actively seeking inclusive content. That's one way. And then again, tying that the outcome data, understanding the incremental reach, which is like the term that they use, right? What is the incremental reach that this program is bringing to my network? Okay, so let's understand what's the incremental reach that inclusive programming is bringing to your platform. Um, how do we, uh, and, and, and that's just our data right now is, is looking at the cast level identity. There is so much room to grow that into um, bringing in the research that you all are doing about quality representation and make sure that that's also an input in all of these um, systems. Is it safe to say, Veronica, that you've got, that, that when Nielsen got in the game, you just brought more data to the problem than we've that's ever to that I think that um, our data sets, we have the opportunity to, to scale across a lot more content. So I think where we don't have the opportunity to go really deep into the quality like, um, like you all do, we have the opportunity to scale across a lot of content and then tie that content to all of our other data sets in like a, we're bringing like the, the technology of a billion dollar corporation into this work, which I think is really meaningful. And, I'm proud to be doing this work because if we think about wanting to make institutional change, Nielsen is so ingrained in the world of media. It's, it is an institution in media. And we touch, again, like I mentioned, the clients across the entire ecosystem. So I think just bringing representation as part of the conversation and giving everyone, the whole media industry wants to lean in into this conversation of DEI. And we're like, okay, cool. Here's a data set that you can use to track your progress and to make more informed decisions about um, your level of representation. That's great. Um, thank you so much. So that sounds incredible. So uh, Soraya, um, can you tell us about your work at the Lear Center and why the kind of research you do there is such an important piece of making media more inclusive? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the Norman Lear Center at USC is a research and public policy center that studies the social, political, economic, and cultural impact of entertainment around the world. Um, and the Media Impact Project, which is the research and evaluation arm of the Norman Lear Center, and that's where I'm personally housed, there we study stories, whether in film or TV or documentaries or news. Um, we look at stories and we look at their impact on audiences. So not just what's present in media, but quantifying how that's actually shaping audience attitudes, beliefs, knowledge, behavior, etc. And we seek to understand again not just what is being what is you know being seen on screen, but how um, how it's impacting audiences and what those mechanisms right are. And that way, you know, we can leverage the power of data to help content creators and cultural change organizations understand both what it is that audience are interested in, what they're getting from their content, but also help them implement or develop best practices for actually accomplishing the outcome that they have. It's one thing to, to want to try to influence audiences in a, in a certain way, and it's another thing to actually be able to accomplish that, right? So that's where, where we come in, um, and we are helping creators, again, quantify their impact um, and develop their best practices so that they can have the intended outcome that they want on audiences. 
So Rai, can I just jump in here a second and ask about the method? Because I know there's probably some researchers watching um, who are well aware that it's so hard to measure impact, right? Which is why there are so few media, actual media impact studies. Um, what are, are the various methods that you use to assess that? Yeah, so there are a variety of um, different methods that you can use, again, depending on the context, right, what's most appropriate will vary, but there's always, you know, doing a pre and post um, a survey of where you're actually, you know, measuring um, people's, their change in their attitudes or change in their knowledge, both before and after they have watched um, particular content that you're interested in. And of course, when it comes to that, there are all of these other confounding variables in terms of have they seen this before? How long ago did this storyline air? So those are all factors that you need to take into consideration. And depending on those other factors, you might go with another methodology. One thing that we do at the Norman Lear Center is propensity score matching. They put me, they sent me back to stats class for this. Um, but propensity score matching, which is a way in which we, we can take um, audience input impact data, and we can essentially um, use statistics as a way to um, kind of tease out causal impact and causal effect in data um, that is not normally conducive to that kind of analysis. So there are a variety of things that you can do versus, you know, we're, we're you know, um, changing methodology from a pre and a post or an experimental design where you're actually choosing the storyline that you are exposing people to, or you can also use um, advanced statistical methods like propensity score analysis to kind of get at some of these issues. Oh, thank you. So, so the last kind of question and getting to an answering for all of you, I had the pleasure of teaching a social justice boot camp last semester with my fellow professors on this call. And so something that we kind of asked the students to do at the end was so I gotta consider like 10 years out. So now that if you're thinking like, what happened after college? Uh, how did I get here doing this? Uh, what is uh, sort of that life path? And what inspired you to continue to do that work? And what was the kind of click moment or aha moment where, where you knew working with social justice issues was something you would continue to do and pull into not just your life, but also your work? Um, I will I will jump in. Um, what a great question. And I could talk about this all day. But um, I think there are many things that led me to this particular path. But there are a few things in particular that come to mind. Um, you know, first, I grew up in a household that was very much invested in traditional gender roles. And I struggled quite a bit. I struggled quite a bit with that. Um, uh, it wasn't quite so much that I couldn't measure up because I could, if I dressed a certain way, if I acted a certain way, I could measure up. But it was the discrepancy between not wanting to measure up to those standards and having them imposed on me that I really struggled with. Um, and now, you know, today I have a graphic actually on my website that says, there are a lot of things I want to accomplish in life. Being a lady isn't one of them. Um, and it's actually inspired by the time when I was eight years old and I was sent to etiquette school because I kept getting in trouble at home for not sitting like a lady. Um, so that's where, that's where that came from. And what feminism did for me, in particular intersectional feminism, um, is give me a framework for understanding what was happening in my life and for understanding the discrepancy both between my values and the values that were being imposed on me. And it allowed me to set myself free from those expectations. Um, so, you know, people can impose expectations or impose beliefs on you, but you don't have to hold yourself to them. You can choose your own. And in that sense, uh, you can be free, right? And another thing, another big thing that comes to mind is I also grew up in Texas, right? So my broader community was ideologically very different from me. And it taught me very, very early on the importance of a well-crafted argument, the importance of being able to back up your opinion with data and knowledge and just a really well-crafted argument. Um, and I did that as a little child walking around arguing with everybody. And I think that that really kind of now helps explain my love of data and my interest in leveraging data for social good. I can jump in next. All right, I love learning that about you. Um, I mean, it's, I grew up in a working class, mixed status family um, with very little educational opportunity, like for my high school. So I think I, I knew like, and, and because I was like a higher performer student and like I put that in quotations because like that, 
that's because like I fit into the like uh, I I behaved in the way that like I was expected to behave. Um, so I got access to certain opportunities. I was exposed to the way that other um, other students in in higher income communities uh, the opportunities that they had. And that just made it really clear to me that there were discrepancies in, in the opportunities that were afforded to a community like mine and theirs. So I knew, always knew that I wanted to improve my conditions and the conditions of my community. So I thought I was gonna pursue policy and, and my degree is in urban and environmental policy. Um, I knew research was important. I also was very drawn to having a hard skill. And that's why I learned a little bit of, of computer science, a little bit of programming. I wasn't going to be a computer scientist, but I thought data analysis was like the right, um, the right skill for me um, so that I can perform like higher level research or, or make, have another like research tool. Um, and the reason why I ended up doing media representation research well, Professor Haldeman tapped me to work at the Gina Davis Institute, and that's when I got exposed to the impact that media has in our perceptions of self and of others. And I started realizing that media in some ways is, is um, in policy to me seemed like it was, it moved really slow and it was very reactive to issues, whereas media is very proactive about like um, in, influencing people. And there's also like having been exposed to like the advertising industry, there's so much money and capital, like it's insane that is that exists in this industry that I wanted to tap into that and and change it. So um, that's kind of how working in media representation at Nielsen made a lot of sense to me because it combined like the the skill set that I wanted to have, which was data analysis um, in an industry that is very proactively trying to change and reach new audiences and doing work that mattered to me, which was like changing the, the conditions of um, my, for myself and my community. I'll jump in. Uh, so I actually didn't know what I wanted to do um, when I first started college, uh, but that completely changed after I took my first sociology class. I think learning that there was actually a science behind an inequity sparked a fire in me that led me to take several ethnic studies courses, gender studies courses. I did everything that I could to understand the system and made it my mission to be a part of some kind of change. Uh, working at the Gina Davis Institute and the Representation Project as a researcher has been such a privilege in that I'm directly contributing to the change that I've been hoping for since I was a kid who just wanted to see people who looked like me on screen. Uh, now I'm at CGU Claremont Graduate University and I'm studying user experience and I'm just really working on expanding my research skills to drive equitable change within the tech industry and my goal is to use data to create online experiences that are accessible and usable for everyone alongside designers and engineers. The funny thing is, I never knew these professional opportunities were possible for me or even that they existed until I learned about them from other people as an adult. Uh, I think that a lot of career paths aren't known in working class communities and among Latin people um, due to a lack of exposure. So it's really um, a common occurrence. And I just want to throw out there, if anybody here is looking to get into the field, you can feel free to connect with me and we could talk back and forth and yeah, I'll share my story and hear from you. Great. Well, let's get your social media handles before we take our last question, right? And then we're going to jump into the chat. So get your questions in there, folks. Uh, Pamela, how can people reach you? Uh, I'll drop my LinkedIn and then I'll also drop my email in the chat. Excellent. Okay. Veronica, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, same. I'm going to drop my email address and my LinkedIn. I love technology. All right, Soraya. Um, I will also send my info through the chat, but in general, in terms of best way to contact me, I do a lot of talking about media, talking about media representation issues, talking about, um, you know, media research studies as they come out on my Instagram, um, which is at Soraya Giacardi, so just my full name, but I will also drop it in the chat 
because um, that name is not easy. So <laughs> you can find me there. Great, thank you. And the last question is, what great media content are we watching, reading, listening to that features excellent representations of Latin women? Let's start with you, Soraya. So I am, um, I'm enjoying Hentified. I'm also enjoying One Day at a Time, Vida. Unfortunately, as we see with a lot of these shows is they get canceled. Um, I am also enjoying Station 19. Um, and then in terms of books, I am really enjoying, there's two books right now that I'm kind of reading um, in tandem. And um, one of them is Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed. And the other one is Four Brown Girls with Sharp Edges and Tender Hearts. And so those are two really great book recommendations um, that I definitely, I definitely recommend. I'm really enjoying them. Thank you, Soraya. How about you, Veronica? What are you reading, watching, listening? I'll point to one podcast that I love. It's called Locatora Radio. It's led by two Latinas that are not that much older than me and grew up not too far away from me here in LA. Their um, podcast is described as a radiophonic novella archiving the brilliance of women of color. And they bring on a lot of amazing um, Latin women uh, who are doing really cool stuff. So. I highly recommend that podcast. They also have a really big social media presence and they're, they're fun. Thank you. Okay, Pamela, what are you watching, reading, listening to? So it's really funny that Veronica <laughs> mentioned Locatora Radio because that is what I was going to say. Um, it's a really great podcast. They cover topics on pop culture, mental health, and social justice. And it's really good to get that representation and hear from uh, fellow Latin women. Um, it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you're interested in checking it out. And also, I just recently saw Encanto, and it's my new comfort film. Very cute. <laughs> it's, yeah, amazing. Uh, we've been talking about so many aspects of that film. Um, let's jump right into our questions, and what an excellent conversation so far. Um, and so someone asked about the use of the term Latin versus Latinx, and we, we can throw in there Latino and Latina, right? Um, and Soraya did reply, um, and I don't know if it went to everyone, but some great, a great question, Amber. Some people prefer Latin over Latinx since the term originated from Latin circles and is easier to conjugate in Spanish. The argument is that Latinx centers English and the academics who use the term. Uh, Soraya personally uses both depending upon the context. So I just read your reply, but maybe Soraya, you wanna speak more to that. Yeah, so excellent question. And the amount of reading that you can do on that question alone, it's a huge topic of debate, right? Using Latino or Latina, Latinx, Latin. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely um, a debated topic. Um, I, so the, the idea behind Latinx, right, is that it takes the gender out of the equation, right, which is typically Latino or Latina, Latina right? So Latinx, um, takes the gender out of the equation. But again, Latinx is actually kind of tricky to say in Spanish. If you're a Spanish speaker, Latinx just doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Um, and it also originated, um, you know, in academic circles. So other people, right, argue that we should be using Latin, which is easier to conjugate in Spanish. And it origina originated in Latin circles. Um, I think I personally use both. Um, it depends on the context. It depends on who I'm speaking to or what I'm speaking about. Um, but I personally use both. And of course, the origin of, of Latinx is a desire to have a gender inclusive term. And yeah, it's uh, Latin might, it, Soraya, uh, we've talked about this, I think at some point about the, the origin of it too, right? Um, that it, it's actually coming from Latin people. And, you know, the academic, I mean, we're really good at making up terms to remain relevant and also to try to be inclusive. Um, but if there's a term that is actually coming from the people who are being described, that's the term we should be using. Um, I think Claire's got a question in the Q&A. Yeah, so this is uh, directly for you, Pamela. Can you tell us a bit more about your journey getting involved in the tech industry and user research? I uh, would love to know more about your, your leveraging of your sociology background in the space and how the tech industry can be more accessible and inclusive. 
That's a great question. Thank you so much for sending that in. Um, I, like I said earlier, really didn't know that these opportunities existed as a young adult. <laughs> like I just learned about it after meeting someone who knew about the field and was an insider. Uh, so it's really interesting how these kind of opportunities are really happenstance for a lot of people, especially if you're from like a working class uh, community and Latin community. Um, let's see, accessibility. Well, I think one of the biggest issues is that, you know, tech isn't known for being usable for all people. Uh, a lot of times it's really difficult for certain people living with disabilities to kind of navigate certain things. And uh, I think really getting on the ground and talking to users um, of certain uh, apps, you know, products, is really valuable to learn more about accessibility, um, doing things like user testing um, and card sorting, all of that can really help you learn a lot about, um, get some insights about how to make technology more inclusive. Also just like wanting to be a presence as a brown woman in the um, tech industry is kind of, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, a little bit difficult to get in there. So I, um, like I said, if anyone wants to connect, I, I think I can share tips of how I've broken um, and my LinkedIn and email are in the chat. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and just a, a follow-up to um, how, so all of you have brought up intersectionality in your work, right? So we're talking obviously here about the intersection of race and gender. Um, but you're bringing up other intersections as well for Latin women. Can you talk um, a, more, any of you or all of you talk more about how intersectionality, that approach informs your research, informs your work? Yeah, I think as a product, um, think like as a product manager from the very beginning, intersectionality was important. And some of what I heard at the beginning was like, well, we don't have to start there. Like, let's just start with like the major identity groups. Um, but that would have really set like a very different tone and it wouldn't have achieved from the offset what we were trying to achieve. So we didn't, we, in our product, we have over 65 intersectional identity groups across like race, ethnicity and um, gender and sexual orientation. And that was just really important so that it's, now we're having meetings with advertisers, networks, content developers, and we're talking about intersectionality and the need for more Latin queer representation and content. And that's, it's part of the conversation, it's in the product and they're gonna use the data and see it. So um, it's, it's really part, like really important to be part of product design from the very beginning. Yeah. And I think in terms of research, intersectionality informs the types of questions that you ask, right? And it's really easy to miss important things that are happening in media if you don't have that intersectional lens. So I'm actually thinking of a report that the Norman Lear Center did actually before my time. So I did not unfortunately work on that report, but they did a report on pol uh, depictions of pol policing and television. You cannot talk about policing without also talking about intersectionality and how policing has a different impact on different communities, right? So as a researcher, um, I think you just miss a lot of nuance if you're not using intersectionality as a framework um, when you're kind of designing or writing out, like, what are my research questions? What do I want to know? Yeah, so it's fun when in the pre-production stages, as Veronica's pointing out and Soraya is pointing out, it just, it, it actually determines your research design. Um, can, Pamela, did you want to hop in on that or should I move to the next question? Yeah, I'll hop in. Um, going off of Soraya, what Soraya said, uh, I saw some statistics the other day about how uh, women or Latin people in general and all people of color aren't represented in media uh, like who have disabilities. Uh, people living with disabilities are represented as uh, overwhelmingly white. So, uh, you know, it's like everyone exists. We, we are not a monolith and it'd be really great to see more uh, representation for 
already people who are underrepresented, but even further underrepresented by, uh, you know, excluding people who are Latin with uh, living with disabilities, mental health problems, uh, anything like that. It's, it's just really disheartening not to see those stories told. Mm. And you're speaking to the importance of intersectionality and, and make it so the idea, right, that if you can't see something, then you can't be something, right, Miriam, right, Edelman, this uh, educational pioneer talking about the power of seeing yourself on the screen. And, and Pamela, you're bringing up the fact that if you are someone with multiple marginalized identities, um, then you're not seeing yourself at all. Um, or, or very, very little. So, um, and Veronica, you're talking about how you can actually be precise about those representations in order to make the content overall more inclusive. Okay, so great question from Rebecca Cooper. Uh, she said, as a fellow research nerd, I'm curious about your dream research study. Uh, what would it be if you had all of the funding that you need? I'm just gonna drag this question out so you can think about this while my kitty stretches. If you had all the money you needed, because we know research studies take a long time and they're super expensive, um, what study would you design? Um, Soraya, do you wanna go first? Put you on the sure. Um, and, you know, so kind of broadly speaking, um, I, I love longitudinal work. I love when we um, can talk about change over time. Um, a lot of times, again, research is expensive. So we might do one big research project on a particular topic for one year, and then we cite that same study for the next like 20 years, right? And um, I think that's the flaw in the research process. And if all the money um, were available, I would love to make everything, you know, longitudinal where we can always, you know, focus on, um, change over time and um, yeah I might think of more but off the top of my head that's that's one of the the things I would love to do more you see of. all the big smiles here from all the research needs the nerds needs nerds it is a need longitudinal data data over time that's awesome yes Soraya how about you Veronica what's your dream study I don't know if I thought about a dream study but I think that's something that's missing in uh, our research today is like the intersection of class. I would like to see the intersection of class a lot more um, because I think that, that, that even when, you, when we think about um, Lat Latin representation, like that's also, uh, yeah, there's just a big divide there and something that's really missing. Yeah, thank you. How about you, Pamela? Dream study? Hi. Yeah, my dream study. <laughs> I would really love to learn more about mental health in marginalized communities and just really dedicate a lot of resources. I don't know what my exact research design would be, but um, just to learn more about the intersection between cultures and um, mental health. Thank you. Well, that's all incredible. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. That's the end of our program. And um, thanks to each of our panelists. Um, and we'll hope to see you next week when we're discussing hookup culture in the era of dating apps with Aditi Paul. Uh, same time, same day, Thursday, noon. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Incredible panel. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.